This is CS4510-4-2. Uh, and the topic of today is called Pushdown. Automata. Sometimes uh, referred to as PDA. So Pushdown Automata, not Public Display of Affection. So what is a Pushdown Automata? Well, just think of it like an NFA uh, plus a stack. I haven't talked about what a stack is, but you may have some analogous idea from data structures or something, right? Well, so think of like you have this computer, right? Whatever. It's like loud and annoying or, or something, right? I don't know. Whatever. Basically, it has some input. It has some way to read the input left to right, and it can't go back. And then it also has uh, a stack. It can, like, uh, push things and pop things from the stack as much as it wants. And this stack is, is one-way infinite. So... It can push the whole input to the stack and then decide to do something else, or it can push as it reads from the input. You know, it it's non-deterministic, by the way. Uh, so it can make these kinds of choices. Let's give the formal definition, right? I don't think the formal definition gives any power here, but it's good to, to always recall if we need uh, later on to expand upon some technicality so it's going to be basically like a uh, NFA with some extra steps so we have Q Sigma this is gamma maybe I'll write it like this gamma Delta Q0 and F you might already predict what like eight of these are so Q is the set of states Sigma is the input alphabet. Gamma is what we call the stack alphabet. Now you, you might be thinking, wait a minute, why do we need a stack alphabet? Well, maybe we don't. Sometimes it's convenient if we let uh, sigma equal gamma. We just shorten everything up. Then it's all nice. But in general, this uh, is that part and this is this part right Delta now this is the of course this is where all the interesting things happen Delta is a function which it can take a state it takes part of the input or it doesn't so that's an empty string and it takes the top of the stack it checks if the top of the stack is a certain thing or it doesn't read the stack at all. And it maps that to a set of possible states uh, which it can be in a state and it writes something to the stack. So I'll also write that as this. Now, this is a terrible and ugly formula and it you're not going to understand anything by looking at it. We're at a state. We read from the input. We read from the stack, we move to a new state, and we write to the stack. So we like push and pop. We can quote unquote do nothing by reading and writing the same symbol, or we could just say epsilon, epsilon, right? Q0 is the start state. We have to start somewhere. And F, which is a subset of Q, is the set of final states. Now, a formal definition here is even worse than a formal definition for NFAs or something because there's so many moving parts. So what I'm going to do is just give you an immediate example. So this is a PDA to decide uh, 0 to the n, 1 to the n, such that uh, n is greater than or equal to 0. 
basically what we're going to do is we're going to read through the input, push it into the stack, but then when we see the ones, we're going to pop it out of the stack. And so we're going to keep track that we've s of uh, exactly how many zeros and exactly how many ones we've seen. So there's no real way of actually, in this definition of knowing when the stack is empty. So what we do is we uh, have a special symbol. So we say we, we can formalize this as like uh, gamma equals sigma union, and it's called this, I don't know, stack canary. That's just, you know, when the end of the stack is. So first thing we do then is uh, we push the stack. So I'm going to write the transition like this. Actually, I'll do the circles with the, with the fancy way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, push the uh, canary onto the stack. So I'm going to say, uh, read nothing from the input, read nothing from the top of the stack, and then push the canary. This is what a trans instead of a transition having one symbol on it, now it has three, separated by this comma and this arrow. So this is read from input, read from top of the st stack, push to top of the stack. Now. While I'm in the stack, I want to just keep pushing zeros until I see a 1. So what that means is every time I read a 0 from the input, I'm going to push it into the stack. So I'm going to add a transition like this, and I'm going to say I'm going to read a 0 from the input, uh, pop nothing off the stack, and then push a 0 onto the stack. If you set this to be not empty, you're popping off the stack, right? And then I'm going to continue this until I see a 1. So when I see a 1, I want to take this transition. So if I read a 1 off the input, I'm going to pop a 0 off the stack and push nothing. And then while I'm here, I'm just going to keep popping uh, for every 1 I see. I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm going to read a 1 on the input, write uh, pop a 0 off the stack and push nothing. Now, what do I want? I want to stop doing this. I want to stop doing this when I see the stack canary, right? So, I'm going to. I can't. There's no way of me telling when I see nothing in the input when I'm at the end of the input, but that's fine because we can actually sort of abuse non determinism here. I can say I read nothing from the input and I'm going to read the stack canary and I'm going to push nothing so i'm going to empty the stack essentially i'm going to pop the stack canary off i'm going to empty the stack so what are my accept states this is the accept state this is an accept is this is one accept state but also the start state why empty string should be accepted so this is the uh pda for a pda which decides zero to the n one to the n now i'm going to do two things I'm going to expand on this in two ways. I'm going to show you how to write it like an algorithm, right? Like code. And then I'm going to give you a view of the execution of what happens uh, to this on some inputs, right? It's a new, it's a new kind of computer where uh, discussing its power. So first I'm going to say, uh, push, mm -hmm. push uh, the canary while read zero in input uh, push zero while read uh, one in input pop zero and then uh so i'll say this is three and then Except if uh, C, if we see uh, that with no with with no input left, what does that mean? If you notice, it's sort of it's non-deterministic again. So if we're at a state and we see a symbol that we're not supposed to. 
we immediately reject. So that's obvious in the state diagram, but not necessarily in the code. Now let me give you an execution of this uh, PDA on two inputs. I'll give you the execution on one one excuse me on uh, zero one excuse, zero zero one one, and then we'll do some other string which might reject. Okay, let me give you an execution of 0011 on uh, the stack. So first, we have 0011 on the input. We're at, uh, we, we're at this symbol, and the stack is currently empty. This is the initial configuration. After one step, we read nothing from the input, read nothing from the stack, and push the canary. So this gives us, in this position, like so. Okay, now while we read zeros, we're going to push zeros. So we're going to read this zero and push it. So we're going to, that's going to move us to the second spot and push the zero. Read the zero, push the zero. So then we move to this one. And then the stack looks like zero zero fact. Okay. Now uh, we're gonna read the one, pop a zero off. So this is gonna get us to zero zero one one. We're gonna move, we're gonna read the one, we're gonna pop a zero off. So we're gonna be left with that on the stack. And this this is the top of the stack where we can pop things off. And this open means it's infinitely down this way. Uh, then we read this one, and we just have the stack canary. Now we know when we're at the end of the input. Uh, so we read nothing from the end of, we were at the end of the input, we read the stack canary, and we push nothing. So we then just move to the accept state. So we just, I'm just going to say accept. Like that. That's what happens, uh, to the execution on this. Another thing, anytime we read some part of the input, we can't go back. We can uh, not do anything. We can like stall, but we cannot go back and see what we already did. We have to only go forward. And anytime we read a symbol, we can't stop. If we, if we read the symbol, we have to go to the next symbol. So let's try 001. Mm, no, let's try 011. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to have the input 011. We're going to be at the zero. The stack is going to be empty. We push the canary. So it's going to be 011 again. We don't move in the input and we're going to push the canary. Next, let's push the zeros we see. So we're going to say 011. We're here now. After we're here now after we push the input. So now we have zero uh, canary in the stack. Now we see a one. So we we have to take this branch, right? It's non-deterministic. We could also always reject or whatever. But if we see a one uh, we and we see a zero at the top of the stack, then we pop it off, right? So it's going to go zero, one, one. It's going to take us to here, and we pop it off the stack. Now... Because we haven't defined if we read a one in a canary off the top of the stack, that means we have to reject. This is only for the end of the input, right? So this is a reject. Similarly, let's do one more. Let's just do one zero. So what's what's gonna happen is we're gonna have one zero in the input. We're gonna push the canary, so it's gonna be one zero again. Now we're at this state. We see a one. We can't see, and there's no zeros at the top of the stack, so we can't take this transition. So we would have to like do that, right? So we just immediately reject. So that's what this uh, execute. That's what a view of the execution of this looks like. If we end in an accept state after we're done.
Okay, let's give another example of a language. Now, immediately when you see a stack like this, you think, wow, this is perhaps a natural problem solver for a very specific language. Uh, we're going to uh, show the language WWR such that W is in Sigma star. W is any word. Uh, this language is, in fact, uh, decidable by a pushdown automata. And you might be thinking, actually, yeah, that makes sense. What I'm going to do is push the ha first half of the input in and then pop it out as I'm reading the second half of the input. And then using that, I'm going to decide uh, if it's in if it, if it's this pa sort of even length palindrome or not. There is a little bit of a catch though, with and we have to use non-determinism to determine when the middle of the input happens because we don't actually know. So of course we're going to need a, like a start state. We're going to need to push the stack canary and then push half the word in. Then at some point we're going to switch to a normal. Uh, where, we, where we're reading the second half of the input and popping off the stack, and then we need to uh, accept the stack canary. So let's just go ahead and do that, right? So I'm going to just go ahead and make this an accept, an accept state. Right. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to push the stack canary. So what does that look like? That looks like epsilon. I'm going to read nothing, uh, read nothing from the input read nothing from the stack and push uh, the canary. Now, uh, I'm gonna draw it like this, just so we have a little more room. Now, while I'm in the, uh, while I'm reading the input left to, left to right, what I'm gonna do is if I see a zero in the input, I'm gonna pop nothing off the stack and push that zero. If I see a one in the input, pop nothing off the stack and push that one. Now, when do I decide to stop pushing and start popping? I don't know. Here's the superpower of non-determinism. I don't have to know. I'm just going to say non-deterministically go to this state. It's going to reject all the other ones except when we're exactly at the half, which is, which is what makes it nice. Now what I'm going to do is if I read a zero from the input, I'm going to pop a zero off the stack. If I read a zero off the input and I pop a zero off the stack, push nothing onto the stack. If I read a one on the input and a one onto the stack, pop nothing off the stack. Uh, then when I'm out of input, so I'm out of input and the canary means I'm out of stack, that means uh, I accept. So I again, I pop the canary, push nothing, stack is empty, and I accept. So the trick here was knowing that the halfway point was determined by non-determinism. Suppose we didn't, we, we took this some earlier chance or something. If we took it earlier, maybe we'll match something, but then we won't be at the end of the input and the end of the stack at the same time to get to the accept state. If we popped, if we took this uh, epsilon transition maybe le uh, after ha the halfway point of the input, then we would be at the end of the stack, but not at the end of the input. So we would again reject. There would be, there's an implicit reject transition there. Right. So this is a PDA for WWR. Uh, it's quite nice. Now I'm going to give you one more example of a, uh, a PDA. Okay, let's do one more language. Let's do um, A to the I, B to the J, C to the I, such that uh, I comma J are greater than or equal to zero or so we're going to take a union of a to the i b to the i uh c to the j such that uh i comma j are greater than or equal to zero i'm writing it this way as a union but i could really say this is the same as um a to the i uh, B to the J, C to the K, such that I equals J, or or I equals K, right? So what the reason I'm writing it like this is so I can basically treat this as two parts, and this or is doing the heavy lifting of the union here. 
So I'm really going to do like two push down automatas and then I'm going to like do epsilon transitions uh, to go on both. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and just write all my states out. And maybe if you're seeing, if you're doing this, you can try and follow along. So what I'm going to do is this first part uh, is going to have two states. The next part is going to have uh, three states. And then I need some way to combine them. So I'll have one part here and I'll, I'll do one like this too. Why not? Okay. So here's my start state. Uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to push the canary first, obviously. So I'm going to say epsilon, epsilon, push canary. Okay. Now, if I see any number of A's, let's just push those to the stack. So if I see an A, I'm going to pop nothing and push an A. Then, at the right moment, non-deterministically, I'm going to choose whether I care about the B's or the C's. So we do that by these epsilon transitions. Read nothing, read nothing, push nothing. Read nothing, read nothing, push nothing. Now, let's suppose I'm here. If I, uh, let's say I'm here. If I see an, a B in the input, I'm going to pop an A. Right? Until I see the canary. So what that's going to look like is I'm going to read the canary and push back nothing. Then I don't care about the C's at all. So I'm just going to just say, uh, just read the C's. Who cares? Don't push anything. Don't pop anything. Who, who, no one, no one's asking about the C's. And then accept that state. Now let's say I take this epsilon transition. What I'm going to do is while I'm here is, um, so this is the branch where I equals K. So I don't care about the B's when I'm here. So I'm just going to say, ignore all B's. So I'm going to say, read the B's, push nothing, pop nothing. Then I want to suddenly start caring about the C's. So let's take an uh, epsilon transition. I could make this the transition where I see the first C, but I also uh, want to accept possibly no C's, right? I want uh, the accept state to be uh, the empty string to be accepting as well, technically. So, excuse me, the empty string to be accepting. So when I'm here, now I have gotten rid of all the Bs non-deterministically, and I want to read a C in the input and then pop an A. So I'm going to read a C in the input, read an A in the input, and delete that A from the top of the stack. So I'm just going to like, so what I'm doing here, if I, if I follow this path, what I've done here push the A's, all the A's, go here, just ignore the B's, go here, and then for each A I pop out of the stack, I'm also reading a C in the input. And I'm only going to accept when I've, when these number of C's that are in the input I've seen is exactly the number of A's. So I'm just going to write it like that, where the, the input is empty and the stack is empty. So this is in the accept state. That is a, another example of the power here of non-determinism, right? I could have said, okay, force this to be a C and then make this an accept state, right? But uh, it's good that we didn't do it this way. It's good we did it this way. So you can see this is sort of the, the double epsilon transition here. It kind of is like a union, right? And as we execute it, one path will accept if the input is in this language, which is, an, which is all we care about. And it won't accept anything not in this language either. So it's correct. This is a very uh, sort of direct example of a, of a pushdown automata. Now I'm going to talk about exactly what the power of pushdown automata are, like compared to the other computers we've discussed. Okay. Now to discuss the relative power of uh, pushdown automata, let's talk about our current picture of the universe. These are regular languages. These are the CFLs. So they should be certainly be closed to so the CFLs. Right now, we have a picture where there exists a language which is regular. There exists languages which are context-free and not regular, and there exists languages which are context which are not context-free. So, how can we fit in the relative power 
of the push down automata into this picture? Well, the first thing to think about is what kind of languages can uh, the push down automata decide with respect to the regular languages? And if you're smart enough, you might notice that actually every regular language can be decided on a pushdown automata. Why? You just ignore the stack. You just go through the states. So, right, when normally you have transitions of the form, epsilon, I'll, 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 say, I'll say this, I'll say A, B goes to C. Well, you can simulate an NFA on a... Uh, on a uh, PDA by just reading the input. So clearly, uh, regular languages are a subset of those languages which are decidable by a PDA. And in fact, it's a strict subset. Why? Because I showed that uh, 0 to the n, 1 to the n. This is the canonical example of a context-free language. This is in... Uh, I, I gave a PDA to decide that, and we know that's not regular. So this is actually a strict subset, right? So, so far, the picture we have is that PDAs are more powerful than... DFAs and NFAs and regular grammars. But all the languages we showed so far were actually context free. So now we have a we have two a couple options. Just with the uh, the places we could go. So it could be the case that uh, PDAs are eek or less than uh, context-free languages. So there could exist a context-free language which act, in fact couldn't work on a PDA. It could be the case that the PDA is more powerful than a context-free language. So we could somehow simulate a grammar on a PDA and then show existence of a language which we know is not context-free but can be decided on a PDA. Or it could even be orthogonal. right? It could be something that looks like this. We're sure it contains regular languages, and it contains some of the context-free languages, but there are context-free languages which aren't uh, decidable by a PDA, and then, but there are also languages decidable by a PDA uh, which are not context-free. So those are sort of some of the directions we can go to. But you'd be really... You might be surprised to know that, actually, the language is, the language is decided by uh, a PDA are exactly those are context-free. So what does that mean? A context-free grammar and a push-down automata are equivalent in power. They're equivalent models. How do we prove this? Well, how do you think? We're going to do a double subset containment. We're going to convert a PDA to a uh, grammar and vice versa. Okay, so this uh, is actually a very complicated, very complicated proof. Uh, I'm going to do the hard direction first. I'm trying to prove, recall, I'm trying to prove that push down automata are equivalent to CFLs. So, context free grammars, right? So, what that means is uh, for each uh, push down automata P, uh, we form some grammar G uh, such that uh, the language of this push down automata is equivalent to the language of the grammar that we described and this will have to be done by double set containment so this is the more complicated direction what i'm going to do is take any push down automata and convert it into a grammar show that a grammar exists for it and then show that that grammar is correct what we first need to do though is we need to make uh we need to make uh, P nice. So what that means is we sort of pad our definition of a pushdown automata to contain uh, some really nice, like nice structure. So the first thing is one, we have a single start state. Uh, two. 
uh, to accept. We require uh, the stack to be empty. And three, uh, each uh, transition must either a push or pop or bop or pop, but not both. So to explain why a PDA with these rules is still equivalently a PDA. This isn't a restriction or a generalization. Oh, excuse me. I said single start state, final state. Let me just. So of course we always have to have one start state. So if we, if you suppose that we did have several uh, final states, what we could do is then add a dummy uh, final state and epsilon transition to this final state, make this, ex make this a final state, and make these not final states. Right? We have epsilon transitions in the definition of a pushdown automata. To accept, the stack should be empty. Basically, if we could accept where the stack is not empty, we just like pad it out. So we dump the stack and then we accept, right? So if this was previously an accept state, what we do is we dump the stack. So we say read nothing, uh, pop a one and push nothing or read nothing, pop zero and push nothing. And then finally, when, when the stack is empty, so we're going to say epsilon, we're going to read this, the canary, then we accept. So that's how we would do uh, that that addition. Each transition must either push or pop or not both. So suppose we had a, had a transition which did nothing, right? So what would that do? It did, let's say it read something or possibly nothing. And let's say it read A and pushed B. All right, so this is not allowed by this new restriction. But what I'm saying is this is actually equivalent if we just forgot to push and did it immediately after. So what we're going to do is we're going to read whatever we read originally, pop A, push nothing, have this dummy state here, read nothing from the input, read nothing from the stack, and then push B, which we were supposed to, to begin with. Similarly, if we were going to uh, read whatever from the input, push nothing and pop nothing, then that's equivalent to pushing a dummy and then popping that dummy. Right? So I'm going to say we're going to read whatever we were supposed to, uh, pop nothing, push a dummy, let's just say A, then we're going to read nothing from the input, pop A, and uh, push nothing again. So these I claim are equivalent, right? We're just pushing A, popping A in one step. We have this extra dummy state here, so we allow this. Now this is just going to help us form our grammar. So let me now define how we're going to form the grammar. Uh, recall that a pushdown automata has several parts. We have a Q. We have a uh, input alphabet. We have a, t a stack alphabet, transition function, a single start state, and we have a final state. Here, instead of a set of final states, I'm just going to call this QF because now we have a single final state. And recall that a grammar context-free grammar is of the form, what do we have? We have a set of uh, non-terminals, we have a set of terminals, or the alphabet. Instead of P, I'm going to say R for the rules, the production rules, normally you say P, and the start symbol. So now we're going to define G in terms of P. So what I'm going to say is uh, uh, V is going to be uh, for each, I'll say, uh, for all Q, I, uh, Q, J, in Q, so for each pair, A, I, J is in V. So we define a non-terminal for each pair of states in Q. And uh, informally, A, I, J uh, generates all uh, strings 
which uh, could take uh, p from uh, qi uh, to qj internally. Okay, uh, sigma is going to be the same. Uh, S, I'm going to say the start state first. The start state, using this sort of uh, hand wavy definition, AI generates all strings which could take P from state A, state QI to state QJ. For it to be decided by the language, we want the strings which take the pushdown automata from the start state to the final state. So it makes sense that this start state should then be uh, A0F, where this takes from the start state to this final state. Right Now, the set of rules. So I'm going to say, uh, consider, consider uh, this definition. So let uh, for all QI, QJ, QK, QL, in Q and let uh, A be some uh, input symbols and let U be some symbol in our stack alphabet. And I'm going to say if we have the rule, I'll write it a little bit forward. If we have the rule uh, Q, K, uh, U is in uh, delta Q, I, A, uh, epsilon. So what this means is the transition function input, we're at QI, we read A off the input, we pop nothing off the stack, then we transition to possibly more things, but including state QK, and we push U. So we push U into the stack. If this is true, and um... QJ epsilon is in QL. Uh, we read B off the input and we read U off the stack. So if we're at QL, we see B in the input and we see U at the top of the stack, we transition to QJ and push nothing. So we pop U off the stack. Here we're pushing U onto the stack and then we're popping U off the stack. If this is the case, uh, then we add... Uh, production rule of the form a i j goes to uh a a k l b i'll explain this in, in much more detail in the proof but this is just the construction for now uh then that's just one type of rule we have actually three kinds so if uh for all q i q uh, J and QK, we add the rule QI, uh, we add the rule AIJ goes to AIK, AKJ. So internally, if you think AIK generates all the strings which could take P from QI to QJ, this is like going from QI to QK and then from QK to QJ. So we say A takes uh, from QI to QJ, right? That makes sense. Um, it's possible that inside the pushdown automata, we don't, state K is not actually in between I and J, but we have these rules anyway. It turns out it'll work out nicely. It turns out if that's not true in the structure of the DFA, but we add these for all possible states anyway. And then finally, for all uh, Q, I in Q, and this should also, these should also be in Q, we add the rule Q, I, I, excuse me, A, I, I goes to epsilon. So these are the only rules in our grammar. Now, uh, we want to prove that uh, this grammar produces a string if and only if uh, the pushdown automaton accepts it. So we need to do both ways of this. So now we, we've defined G. We need to prove this is a subset of this and this is a subset of this. And we're going to use uh, induction both ways. We're going to use strong induction both ways.
Now, what I'm going to prove first is that uh, if AIJ produces in whom it knows how many steps a string X, uh, then this implies that X uh, brings P uh, from state QI and an empty stack to uh, QJ and an empty stack. It might not be empty, empty between those two, but when you're at QI and QJ, it is empty. And so we're going to do proof by induction on the number of productions. Proof by inductions. So first off, uh, the base case is one step. Why? You start off with a start symbol on your like work tape, and then you have to return a string. You have to return something. So you return... You can't return the start state, so you have to do at least one production, right? So, uh, base case uh, is one uh, step. So, you have to, which rules, which productions can we choose that ended one step? Right? A, I, I uh, produces the empty string. So, X must equal the empty string. And uh, the empty string, uh, it will bring P from QI empty stack. I'm going to write it as ES to QJ empty stack, right? It doesn't bring it at all. So, therefore, the base case holds. Now, uh, the induction step. Assume, uh, we'll call this the forward direction, right? This is actually an if and only if, and I'm trying to prove two directions. So assume the forward direction is uh, true uh, for all uh, derivations uh, less than equal to k. So this is actually like a strong inductive proof. Now, uh, suppose that uh, AIJ will produce a string x, but it does it in uh, k plus 1 steps. So now we want to show that p still goes from qi to qj, right? So we have two choices uh, for our first step. So our first step, either was a production of like a i j goes to a uh, a k l b or a i j went to like a i k a k j right so let's assume this case one so we'll call this i and we'll call this i i Maybe we shouldn't keep calling things I, but whatever. We'll call it case I. Uh, so suppose that uh, suppose that uh, A K L will produce a string in who knows how many steps. Y. So then uh, X equals A Y B, right? And uh, by the uh, by the induction hypothesis, the uh, we know the following is true. We know that P starts at uh, QI. No, P. Yeah, P st starts at QI. Okay, then P uh, reads A. And then it goes to uh, QK, and then it pushes U, pushes uh, some some U. I'm not going to say what it is. We don't know what it is, but it pushes something. Then we know that P reads a Y, 
it goes to uh, QL. It doesn't push or pop anything. And then P reads uh, B goes uh, to uh, say some QJ and then it pops you. So what happens here? This is all true by the induction hypothesis because they're less than uh, k plus 1 derivations, right? So what this all implies is that and this is actually in our in our uh, transition function as the, as we've defined the rules, right? For each qk u in uh, the transition of qi a, a epsilon and uh, qj uh, pop nothing in, excuse me, push nothing in uh, Q, L, B, uh, pop U, right? This is exactly how is it, how our grammar is defined. So then in this case, uh, it's true that X uh, brings a P from uh, Q, I, empty stack to qj empty stack right it's it was empty here we pushed u we popped u we ended at qj so we went from qa empty stack to qj empty stack it's still empty so the theorem holds for that case good now what about uh the second condition if uh what this really is saying is that uh this rule is really sort of like the stack is never empty except at the beginning at the end except at the beginning and except at the end. And the first symbol we push is the last one we pop always. This says at some point possibly state K, the stack is empty at some point, right? So what that says is uh, we have the rule AIJ produces uh, AIK, uh, AKJ. Now, uh, suppose that x equals yz such that uh, y uh, a i k produces uh, y and then a k j produces z in uh, less than k steps, right? Because this is supposed to be happening in k plus one steps, and so these must both happen in less than k steps. Therefore, by the induct, we can apply the induction hypothesis again. So y brings uh, P from QI uh, empty stack to QK empty stack, because this K is the state where the thing might possibly be empty. Then uh, Z brings P from QK empty stack to Q j uh, empty stack so therefore we can just compose this we go from qi to qk and then we go from qk to qj by composing the y and z so that that whole thing will imply that uh, x which by the way remember is equal to yz brings p from a qi empty stack to q j uh, empty stack. So that's true. Therefore, uh, we've proven one direction. We've proven that uh, if AIJ uh, produces X, then X brings P from uh, QI empty stack to QJ empty stack. Now we need to prove the converse. So that uh, now we prove if x brings p from qi empty stack to qj empty stack, uh, then aij will produce the string x. How do we do this? We do we again we do induction. Uh, 
But instead of on the productions, it's the steps of this uh, uh, pushdown automata. Right. So the base case is what? Here, the base case, you don't need one. In fact, a automata can run in zero steps. A grammar must run in one step, technically. We're arguing over very unimportant details, but the base case here is not zero. Excuse me, it's not one, it's zero. So if P runs in zero steps, uh, it can't read anything. So then X must be equal to epsilon. But we have the rule A, I, I uh, produces epsilon. So uh, A, I, I does technically produce epsilon. So that technically satisfies our uh, theorem. So now the induction hypothesis. So assume we'll call this uh, the backwards direction, right? So I'm going to say assume uh, this theorem is true uh, for all computations which take uh, less than or equal to p, excuse me, less than or equal to k steps. Now, suppose we have the, uh, the first part, so suppose x brings uh, p from a qi empty stack to qj empty stack in uh, k plus 1 steps. So we have, again, we have the two cases. So we have case 1. Stack is only empty at beginning and end. So what that means is really the the stack height might increase and decrease, but the first symbol pushed in is the last one pushed out because it's never technically empty, right? So what that whole thing implies is that uh, first pushed in the very first step is the last popped. Remember, we have to we start with an empty stack and we have to halt with an empty stack. So, and suppose it's uh, just we call it U again. Suppose a U in our uh, our stack alphabet uh, read. Suppose we read A in uh, the first move and B in the last move. So that's when we pushed U and then we popped U. For any A, B in our input alphabet. So I also suppose that like QK is uh, is the first state after first move. And uh, QL is is the state uh, like before the last move, right? Well, then it immediately follows that uh, QK uh, pushing U was transitioned from QI reading A uh, popping nothing and that uh, QJ was transitioned to after pushing nothing and we were from QL and we read B, yeah, we read B in the last move, and uh, we popped it. All right. So then this whole thing implies that the rule uh, AIJ produces AAKL, B, uh, should be in G. So this rule should be in G. And it is, actually, by definition, it's exactly in G.
again, uh, there exists some y such that a y b is equal to x, right? So, uh, and why is this whatever middle part? So y brings uh, p from qk empty stack to ql uh, empty stack. So we're, this the whole process took k plus 1 uh, steps, but we are knocking off the first and last step. So, computation of y takes uh, k plus 1 minus 2 equals k minus 1 steps. And we apply the induction hypothesis, apply the induction hypothesis, which then it immediately follows that a k l, the terminal symbol, the non-terminal symbol, will produce... Uh, y. And since we have this rule, AIJ produces this, it immediately follows, and X equals AYB, it immediately follows that AIJ does in fact uh, produce in K plus 1 steps uh, AYB, which is equal to X. So that's the case, one where stack is empty at the beginning, only empty at the beginning at the end, in the computation on X. Uh, case 2, the stack is empty at some point in between. So, stack is empty at at least one point in the middle of the computation, in computation. What we're going to do is sort of like treat this as two computations and treat that point where it's empty as like a pivot, right? So we break it into steps. So uh, suppose it's at state k. Suppose its uh, stack is only empty at one point, and we're at a uh, qk. So then we can say part one is the computation from qi to qk. And then part two is the computation from uh, QK to uh, QJ. Now, since the whole thing takes K plus one steps, each of these is at most K steps. Each is at most uh, K steps. So then you should sort of reactively at this point apply the induction hypothesis. So uh, let's say let uh, x equal yz such that uh, part one, part one, the notation is not so good for this. Part one produces y. Part two produces uh, Z. Well, the induction hypothesis tells us that A I K uh, will produce because it takes less than K steps. A I K will produce Y, and A K L will produce uh, Z. So then, because we have the rule A I K, excuse me, A I J goes to AIK, AKL. Uh, this whole thing implies that uh, AIJ will produce uh, A, excuse me, uh, YZ, right? Well, I'll write it this way. AIK will, uh, in one step, will produce AIK, AKL, which in who knows how many steps will produce y z, which will uh, which is equal to x. So a i j does end up producing x. Wow. Okay, that was an intense proof. 
nothing about this is going to be on any exam, a quiz, or anything, but it's just for some completionary sake. So far, what I've proven is that if these are the regular languages, uh, these are the uh, context-free languages, context-free languages, and that these are the PDA languages, right? I've proven that every PDA language has a context-free grammar associated with it, and that grammar is correct. Uh, this is the harder direction. We're actually going to prove that these two are equal, so that there is no element which is a context-free language which couldn't also be decided by a PDA. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to... So here what we did is we converted the PDA to the grammar, which is the much harder direction. I'm going to show you next the more practical direction. Well, I think I'll show it to you next time, actually, just to make one thing, uh, just to make things more consistent and the videos normalized. I'll save that for the next part. And the next part, uh, we'll show that the lang we'll show that every CFL can be decided by a PDA. That would show. That whole thing will then imply that uh, PDAs are equivalent to context-free languages. Surprising results because they're totally different uh, shapes.